Okay, we'll just wait now. It's open, so we'll wait for people to trickle in. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, I see participants trickling in, so that's awesome. Um, we'll just give a few minutes and or a few seconds here and just see if um, that continues to grow and, and people can get situated before we get started. Okay, um, so hi everybody. My name is Jacqueline and I am one of the co-hosts for this weekend's event. Um, I'm from Ontario, Canada and so good morning, good afternoon and good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, we are happy to have you guys with us. I am super excited to host um, this speaker. Um, but first, I just want to remind everybody that if you have any questions for, our, for today's speaker, please put them in the chat, um, and we're going to have a little Q&A session um, at the end of the session. So just put them there, and um, yeah, we'll answer them as best we can at the end. Um, so without further ado, um, we are very pleased and honored to, to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Squitari here who works in Italy um, and he is here today to share his research on the biology of juvenile HD. Um, so take it away Dr. Squitari. Thank you so much Jacqueline. Uh, many thanks to you for your introduction and uh, I thank HDO for inviting me to have a speech on Huntington's disease in kids today. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to have a chance to speak about autism disease in uh, uh, juvenile people. And uh, I thank particularly HDO for giving uh, sp space and shedding light on this particular topic. Uh, as a neurologist and as a neurogeneticist, uh, I always conducted my studies and my clinics uh, in strict cooperation with the family organizations. We meet uh, many families with the kids uh, to our HD research center is based in Rome and uh, is one of the few under study group in uh, Europe, uh, together with the Lear Foundation and Casas Leo de la Sofferenza Research Hospital, that is also a Holy See research hospital. Um, first of all, uh, let me remind that uh, by interviewing uh, several families with the juvenile onset HD, we noticed uh, for the first time that HD in minors is not only a rare condition, but it is also a very subtle uh, with uh, uh, completely different signs and symptoms from adult disease and overall uh, very misunderstood and accepted and hidden by their uh, parents. So uh, one of the first uh, uh, typical uh, conditions that we uh, face in case of antidote disease in kids is uh, the profound sense of sadness and discomfort that we, I have been reading in the eyes of their mothers since uh, the beginning I was interested in this disease. So I promised to myself to pay all my attention to all was in my possibilities to study deeply the such particular condition. So let me, first of all, uh, make a step back before going, uh, before going on. Uh, let me remind to everybody that uh, Huntington disease uh, how we usually face in clinics is uh, characterized by a mutation uh, that is uh, over 35 repeats. When we deal with a disease from 36 CAG in Huntington gene and uh, over, then this is a mutation. And when the mutation become, becomes longer and longer, then uh, the age at once in offspring anticipates and uh, it may start very early in life, even young children. 
So uh, my presentation will firstly focus on the diagnosis of HD, particularly with a genetic test that is particularly tricky in case, in case of affected kids. Then I shall describe what we learned by the clinical observation in children. Finally, I will mention what we are learning from studies on biology and neuropathology of kids and where the research is currently going in the last part of my presentation. First of all, the first issue we deal with is the molecular genetic diagnosis. So the first uh, challenging situation we deal with the uh, antigen disease in kids is to how to recognize their genetic cause. That is the particularly expanded uh, uh, mutation in their Huntington gene. Technically, to define uh, juvenile onset, that we refer to those young patients who manifest neurological and behavioral symptoms before age 20. Among them, there are also few years old children. In this case, we talk about pediatric HD and the need to detect a large size mutation, sometimes over 60 repeats till several hundred repeats. Such mutations are particularly tricky to detect by usual lab procedures. So what we have recently uh, found and described is a triplet primed PCR methodology set by a Suragen. So I'm uh, happy to present to you uh, just quickly, just shortly, what we found because uh, thanks to such Amplidex methodology based on a multiple primers PCR, uh, we uh, had chance to decrease first negative and offered the chance to pick mutations over 200 repeats by a very reliable procedure. So the first uh, tricky condition we deal with in case of hunting disease in kids is how to recognize very large mutations in their DNA. The other tricky condition is, of course, the clinics. Some juvenile onset patients show symptoms overlapping the adult disease. Once we approach the kids, in other terms, those manifesting with pediatric HD onset, we observe a neurodevelopmental delay more than, than a movement disorders, unlike what we observe in adult patients. In young children, we do not see correct movements like in adults, for example. We see instead uh, something like epilepsy or seizures, uh, which we rarely observe in adults. The question is whether all people manifesting with the juvenile age of onset can be categorized as the real juveniles or they may differ in terms of disease development, progression, severity, according to yet unknown biological factors. So we wonder what such remarkable difference is caused by what about HD biology in children? And finally, what about the role of the genetics? This is a, a, a particularly difficult puzzle to solve and to approach. Likely, we need to make a correct stratification of the patient's population by a proper methodology. So the first issue we need to solve is how to stratify the population of Huntington disease patients. We know from science, for example, that lab models carrying a very expanded mutations show the most severe progression of HD and the shortest lifespan. So the first step is to pick difference within the juvenile onset population and between juvenile and adult patients. This is an example of HD population stratification in the attempt to relate biology to clinics. And this is what we tried to make to differentiate cohorts within juvenile patients and within the adult patients compared to juveniles. The hierarchical cluster analysis 
is a statistical methodology to pick the distance among different groups of variables, is a statistical methodology. By this analysis, we identified different groups of juveniles based on their mutation sites and motor impairment. Such a cluster analysis revealed the population of juveniles with a highly expanded mutation and a clinical motor impairment that was impressive considering their young or ages. The Enroll HD platform helped us stratify the populations and pick the difference between these kids with the larger size mutations and other juvenile and adult patients. Just as a reminder, Enroll HD is a, a sort of a compass. It's like a navigator. It's a research platform that is very helpful for us researchers. And uh, it's like uh, a navigator that drives us along the right way to study the HD in natural history. Uh, just to remember, uh, in the context of uh, uh, um, Luna Rosa, uh, uh, that I proudly, proudly mentioned the, uh, the victory of uh, the sailing uh, of Luna Rosa at the Prada Cup against uh, in US UK team and uh, the friends from UK that are connected will uh, forgive me if I mention that and I hope they will not be too much upset for that. So what we found is anyway is that uh, what we found impressive by such kind of uh, a hierarchical analysis was that uh, what we know now is that the uh, kids with the very large expansions above 70, 80 repeats and the other were, were different from other courts. So highly expanded patients, for example, showed uh, important motor and psychic developmental delay with the early gait impairment, no chorea at all, high rate of seizures that were not visible in other courts of patients. They start working as speaking later. Here are some examples that I would like to show you, just as an example, that um, show you how impressive, impressive is the working issue they started to manifest since a few years of age, the dystonic postures and the, the total absence of correct movements. So if we look at the uh, progression of the disease, these kids with the large mutations and the onset marked by neurological signs show a more severe progression of their motor environment than adult patients. And unfortunately, they also show a shorter lifespan, even shorter than other juvenile cases with the relatively shorter mutations. As you can see on the right side of the screen with the green line that is reporting the low expansion juvenile patients whose lifespan seems not that different from adults. So the question is, uh, uh, what we may conclude? We may conclude that we know that such a huge difference is strongly related to the mutation sites in the patient's DNA. Largest CAG mutations with 70, 80, and more repeats cause a different disease phenotype a more severe disease course in children than in adults and also than young adults with the juvenile onset that should be and shorter repeats. What uh, we uh, uh, may ask is uh, what kind of biological event may justify such remarkable clinical difference? The analysis of an extreme pathological condition such as HD in kids carrying such large mutations may theoretically mirror what we observe in sub lab models with the similar long tossing mutations and where the disease is particularly aggressive. This is the example of the R6 transgenic mouse by Jill Bates. It was the first 
more published model uh, of um, a transgenic mouse in 1996. Therefore, like wise in models, if we study and make clear the biological mechanisms in kids, we might theoretically pick what is hidden in adult disease. And the first question is, is the CAG mutation in kids identical to adults with the exception that is just longer? And the answer is no. The mutation we detect in blood cells in kids is also much more mosaic and unstable, not only totally compared with adults, but to also to the many other juvenile lung patients with a relatively short repeat in antigen gene. And uh, if the CG expansion is staggering in blood, should we expect the same in other tissues? Even if we never got a sample from kids' brain so far, we know that the expanded CAG repeat may increase in some regions in most models. And it was documented at least in a single human age case, as you can see on the right side of the panel uh, by the, the sample of a Sherborne groups uh, of some years ago, where she found uh, triplet expansion in the brain of a thousand repeats. So what to expect? Uh, in the kids' brain then, and uh, in other tissues of kids. What we found very interesting was that, was what we observed in our, by our esturgeon methodology in human cell lines with some additionally, additional previously undetected CAG peaks. Uh, that we documented in vitro in highly expanded patients only. So looking at the cell lines of these guys, we found uh, uh, the additional peaks of expansions in their DNA that were hidden in their blood cells. So the mutation sites may, in principle, increase its length in these particular genetic conditions. So what is expecting its brain then? We do not know what all this lie with the function and morphology of the affect kid's brain. So another question is, should we expect something similar to adults, even for, with a more severe neurodegenerative process? And once again, the answer is no. The brain structure of kids with highly expanded mutations show very peculiar changes. The striatum volume is extremely reduced in kids' brain. And even more strikingly, the brain cortex and the white matter are relatively preserved, as you can see in the left panel. The density of the neurons looks very low, as documented by the brain spectroscopy. And as such a unique evidence was never described before and was unexpected. Adults do not show such a pattern because the neurogeneration affects the brain cortex and white matter before the first symptoms appear and because the striatum shows such a reduced volume only at the last stage of the disease. It was fine, uh, nicely described in several good works from uh, Tabrizzi's group. So, uh, what about the frequency of uh, Huntington disease in juveniles? Even the disease frequency and genetics of Huntington disease look different. Uh, even for it concern the frequency of uh, juvenile uh, groups, we may make some clues that are different from what we normally usually see in adult patients. It seems that there are clusters of affected kids in some geographic areas, like it happens in some specific Middle East regions with a specific genetic background and haplotypes, possibly influencing the juvenile disease frequency. So in summary, there are still several open questions, of course, but uh, what we found in kids with the large site mutations differ from other cohorts in the mutation 
the instability, for example, the clinical presentation, the mosaicism is different, the disease progression is different, the lifespan is shorter, and even the geographical distribution and neuropathology is different. So there are several open questions. First, does the biology of HD in the kids with highly expanded ectosic mutations differ from adults? If so, does it mean that we face with different biological mechanisms? Second, are kids with the highly expanded mutations the real face of a juvenile onset HD? That will mean that we need to question most of the clinical work that have been published so far. And finally, what else do we need to study to pick biological mechanisms further? Is that possible that we observe in biology what we observe in clinics? In other terms, what we observe in biology may correspond to what we observe in the clinical manifestations. In other terms, is the abnormal development of the nervous system correlating to the delayed psychic and motor development of kids with such large size mutations? What we learn from in vitro and ex vivo experiments seem to confirm that. And uh, one example is the impressive result by Alexander Dior and Sandrine Humbert's group, for example, they documented a series of cell and subcellular abnormalities in line with abnormal neurodevelopmental process during human fetus life. Another evidence recently came from a neuropathological study in adult HD by the Columbia Brain Bank researchers. They picked brain malformations. So we need to translate the biological evidence from lab to humans and vice versa. We are running a project called the Rares Juvenile HD, which involves clinics, imaging, and molecular cell biology. The study of the brain connectivity in juveniles is the project's core. We started to collect kids and adults biological samples, clinical information and data, and cell lines, and also advanced brains imaging. This is a collaborative project combining a multidisciplinary expertise from basic to clinical research. Recently, we were very pleased to open to colleagues from Leiden University of Medical Centers who shared with us juvenile brain samples. I wish to acknowledge their work and their collaboration here. And uh, let me get such opportunity to also pick your attention to a special issue of the Journal of Personalized Medicine whom I will serve as a guest editor that will be dedicated to the several different clinical and biological aspects of antidote disease. Of course, pediatric antidote disease is one of the many phases of antidote disease. People may eventually contact me if interested in some data. In conclusion, we need to look at antidote disease kids in kids as the new testimonials who may help us to shed light on the mystery of HD in general, and who must be welcome into therapeutic trials in the, in the near future. This is a target we can aim only through a close collaboration among researchers, family organizations, and pharma industries. Here in the on the screen, please notice some uh, logos from some good organizations that help our work so much, like the European Hunting Association from one side and the Hunting on DC Youth Organization from another side. That is uh, an important testimonial organization for the good work they are doing with the Jew young people. And the Noi Huntington is another Italian organization that is very much related to them. And I would like also here to uh, thank, to acknowledge uh, other organizations like uh, the Join HD Registry, the new juvenile antidote disease registry by HDO, 
thanks to, in partnership with the EHDA and SEHDI from one side, and the Spazio Huntington, a way to meet children in a medical environment from the other side here in Rome that may help to break the wall of stigma. I thank all of you for attending this section. I truly hope we may soon meet in person without masking ourselves, like in the left side of the slide. My final message is, let's hope to take the mask off from COVID-19 as well as from pediatric HD. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, so in terms of those, like um, the size of repeats, um, what kind of size repeats do parents of JHD children have? Are they relatively high? Are they no, like in that 40 to yeah, 50? Yeah, yeah, it's very, the question is very clear. Thank you for asking. Uh, of course, I didn't have the chance at the time to go into the hip of it. But I wish to remark that, of course, we, this depends on how we report and describe the symptoms at onset in the kids. If we refer to uh, behavioral change or uh, non-specific symptoms. Of course, we uh, quite uh, frequently may deal with the symptoms starting at quite a young age and uh, uh, rela they, are, they relate to quite mildly expanded mutations that are very similar to adult people. The issue is, are they true juvenile? Are they real juvenile patients? In general, when we think, uh, when we refer to uh, onset symptoms that uh, are uh, typically of a neurological uh, manifestations, like neurodevelopmental delay or, or gait issues, uh, like what I described in kids, all the time the uh, mutations are very expanded. So in my experience, in our experience, uh, when we refer to juvenile onset patients or at least uh, uh, Huntington disease in kids, we refer to very expanded mutations over 60, uh, starting um, in uh, age under 20 or under 18. Awesome. Thank you for that. So in, you know, speaking about that, um, what happens during the inheritance process that um, these extremely high repeat numbers are reached? What do you mean? Uh, so, in, in like how, how do we reach these high numbers? Is it like the expansion, you know, during the generation and the inheritance? Um, does it just mm. slowly expand? That's, an, that, that's a good question. Of course, what we know is that when the expansion is so high, uh, it is transmitted by affected or at least mutation carrier males. So, uh, it is very likely that uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, issues is related to the CAG repeat instability that is particularly pronounced in uh, male gametes. That is, this is what we know today. Then we also are aware that there are other gene modifiers that are influencing for sure uh, the mismatch repair and the CAG repeat instability. And we don't know enough about what is happening within the CAG repeat, like, for example, uh, interruptions within the CAG stretch or the loss of interruptions. So there could be many genetic or at least biological factors influencing the CAG repeat instability and uh, the CAG repeat mosaicism as well. 
that may partially justify the big, the large expansions in children coming from affected males. Okay, that, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, that sums up our questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Squitteri, um, for joining us and sharing with us. Um, I thank agree you. that, you know, in the last couple of years, the awareness around JHD has definitely escalated. And, you know, with the registry and everything like that, um, it's just going to shed some more light that's desperately needed. Thank you. We need to give to these kids the same ch uh, chance that we are offering to adults. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that said, um, one of our next sessions that you guys can join after the break is with Emily Lawson. And she actually is going to share her story and her experience um, of juvenile Huntington's disease. So that'd be a really nice look after um, this talk on biology. Um, and then the other track is um, a panel on mental health experiences in HD, which with COVID and everything else that's impacting our world is also going to be really helpful for, for those that have um, been impacted by that. Sure. So take a quick break and we will see you guys in the next session shortly. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Secretary.